Tonight, two stories, Red Lobster and White Lobster. The first story, Red Lobster, is about the very visible effects that overfishing is having on this one community on the Mosquito Coast of Nicaragua. The second story is about what the local residents of the Mosquito Coast call the White Lobster. It's about the region's shadow economy. It's about being stuck between Colombia and the U.S. Now, you see where this is going, right? But the first story, Red Lobster. What you're seeing here is a man being treated for what is commonly known as the bends. Clinically known as DCI or decompression illness, the symptoms include chronic muscle and joint pain, numbness, paralysis, and sometimes even death. It's what happens when a diver dives too deep, for too long, or ascends too rapidly. In Mel Garbwick's line of work, it's a growing occupational hazard. Melgar is a lobster diver. Below the sea, mostly hidden from our view, there's an alarming decline in marine biodiversity, scientists are warning. According to a recent UN report, overfishing could lead to the collapse of world fishing stocks in the next 50 years. But how do you measure the effects of dwindling ocean resources or the degradation of fragile marine environments? In Nicaragua, the depletion of lobster has had a very visible effect as the divers who catch them are forced to dive deeper and take ever greater risks to earn a living. We were heading for a remote corner of Nicaragua known as the Mosquito Coast. That's not mosquito as in the bug, but mosquito as in the indigenous people who have inhabited this region for millennia. People like our guide Miguel. After coffee, lobster is Nicaragua's largest industry, and here on the Mosquito Coast, Miguel says it's really the only industry. Lobster diving is part of the fabric of life here, but it's hard not to notice the growing risks of the trade. You walk around this town and you constantly see young men on crutches and wheelchairs. Miguel works for a group that represents almost 500 lobstermen who have had accidents while diving. La situación ahora está más peor porque ya no hay langosta y entonces los buzos van a mucha profundidad y ahí entonces le agarran las enfermedades, síndrome de descompresión y muchos se han muerto. It's 6 a.m. in the morning and we're heading off in a, on a boat to a small village called Sandy Bay where the, most of the community lives off lobster diving. There are no roads connecting any of these communities and the only way to actually get here is by boat. El buceo. Ah. Sandy Bay. That's Miguel is saying that this is where lobster diving started. It was exactly, here in this village. Yes. When the boat come from the um, United States, yeah. it, I can place a tank, then the divers and learn for diving, scuba So diving. at the beginning it was only free diving, yes, there were no tanks, yes, no equipment. Yes, yes. The scuba tank allowed divers to dive deeper and longer, and more importantly, it allowed them to keep up with the growing international demand for Caribbean lobster tails. But it also introduced a new risk, a risk that no one here had ever heard of or were trained to prevent. So Ubaldo was a lobster diver. He did that for six years and four years ago he had his accident. He was diving at 130 feet deep and he ran out of air and he had to rush up to the boat. The next morning when he woke up 
he couldn't feel his legs and since then he hasn't felt anything from his waist down. He's gonna show us around his house. Ubaldo likely suffered from one of two very serious injuries that affect divers. The first is decompression sickness, which is caused by the formation of nitrogen bubbles in the blood. And the second is lung overexpansion, which can cause an air embolism that blocks the flow of blood to parts of the body. Symptoms overlap and the injuries are collectively referred to as decompression illness. If not treated immediately, the damage can be permanent, as in Ubaldo's case. And that's a photo of you there? Mm -hmm. uh, According to a World Bank report, nearly all lobster divers on the Mosquito Coast show some signs of DCI. And in Sandy Bay, we met other divers who have been permanently disabled, like Ruben, 24, who had to have a colostomy to help him eliminate waste and a tracheotomy to help him breathe. And Leroy, who with his one good arm paddled from his home to tell us his story. Leroy has a 28-year-old son who's also a lobster diver and when he started doing that, Leroy told him, advised him not to, but the problem is that there's not many other jobs around. In fact, in some of these seaside communities, up to 90% of men find work diving for lobster. boat ride from the coast and they have these keys here so the lobstermen basically built these houses on stilts where they spend up to 10, 10 days collecting as many lobsters as they can before they head back home. Not far from the huts I found a man who really needs no introduction. My name is John Wayne Pinner Bendis. John Wayne, can I just call you John Wayne? Yeah, sure, sure. John, John Wayne, Wayne stays up here in the, in the canoe and he helps the diver with a changing the tanks yeah, and bringing up the lobsters. Up Why don't you dive? That's on there, make God make that for the fish for the animal, not for the people. Yeah. How many so far? How many? We don't count them. We don't count them. You don't count them? No, it's bad luck. <laughs> bad luck, did you say? No, it's <laughs> And luck is definitely something you want to have on your side when you're a lobster diver here. What's that noise? From the tank? It has a leak? Yeah. They're saying the tank is pretty old and it's not doing so well anymore. Yeah. Do pressure gauge? No, in Nicaragua we don't use them stuff. They're saying that they don't use any pressure gauge or depth gauge or even any watch. So the only way that they know that the air is running out is when they feel that it's hard to breathe and that's when they come up. Fabian is 27 years old and he's been diving for 14 years now. Tu has tenido problemas? Really? He said he had an accident four years ago and uh, he's been suffering from decompression sickness ever since. He, sa he says his uh, joints hurt and he feels very weak. Well, he's still diving because you have to survive. Because of his condition, local authorities allow Fabiano to dive in the shallows where it is normally illegal. But these days, the vast majority of lobster divers work on the high seas, diving to depths of up to 150 feet. This is what they call in an industrial lobster boat, and it just came out back from 11 days at sea, and they're about to unload the lobster. They were out at sea for 11 days and they caught 1,500 pounds of lobster, he's saying. Capitan? Yes, Capitan. Ah, much gusto. <laughs> so he's saying that on a good trip they can bring back up to 7,000 pounds of lobster. 
Sabe quantas vezes, quantos tanques usam no dia? Eu uso 12. 12? Sim, o lo máximo é 16. Isso não é um perigoso para ele? Não, cada salida faz sua parada. Ou seja, faz de um preço. Vamos com esse pecado, louco, rápido! Não, não passa nada mais ou menos, porque há muito visualizado. Sim, há muito porque... Este, há alguns que não têm experiência em isso. Mas experiência na verdade significa little quando você continuamente excede as boundaries de safe diving. As I soon found out, 16 tanks a day is three to four times the accepted limit. And with the lack of basic equipment and training, these guys are taking serious risks. We're going to visit the only hyperbaric chamber that exists here in Nicaragua. The hyperbaric chamber is used to treat decompression illness. Basically what this hyperbaric chamber does is it simulates being underwater with air pressure and the diver is uh, gradually brought up to the surface. The process breaks down the harmful gas bubbles trapped in the blood and tissues. This is where we met Melgar Buik. For best chance of recovery, the US Navy recommends that a sick diver be in the chamber within five minutes of surfacing but it took Melgar 14 hours to get here. Unfortunately, this is considered good timing for here in the Mosquito, according to Jairo Uloa, who runs the chamber. Tiene que esperar que cumpla los 11 o 12 días de estar trabajando allá. Entonces ahí lo trae el buzo, pero ya es bastante, ya es tarde, pues. 1,863 pounds of lobster. On my last day on the Mosquito, I visited a processing plant of one of the largest lobster companies in Nicaragua, Invernique International. This plant alone exports about 25,000 pounds of lobster tails every month. 44 and a quarter. All the lobster that we process here at this plant is shipped to the U.S. Ready for export. Listo para exportar. Listo para exportar. So this is it. It's ready to export. It's a lobster tail. And in about a week, it will likely be served with a side of melted butter in some restaurant somewhere in the U.S. And it'll run you around 25, maybe 30 dollars. But I wanted to know how the company's owner, Gustavo Medina, felt about the price many divers here are paying to satisfy the world's appetite for lobster tails. You know, the, um, it's like everything. Um, we say, well, we stop diving right now, okay? Beautiful. We all stop diving. What happens now? Like about 35,000 people out of work. What do we do? I suggested more training, and on this point, Medina conceded. And naturally, we need training, and we need support. And uh, why do people get killed? Why do people? Can we prevent that? Yes, we can prevent that. And that may be the saddest part about this whole story. Most of these diving accidents are preventable, easily preventable. I returned to the hospital to check up on Melgar Buik. He had just finished his fourth session in the chamber and his father was there to help. He still feels some pain around his neck and he can't move his legs at all, but the rest he says he's feeling a bit better. So the Mosquito Coast's main resource lobster is beginning to run dry, but that doesn't mean that the residents, the people there, have completely given up on the ocean as a means for survival. In fact, as you'll see in this next spot, some people are becoming richer than they could ever imagine, and it's all because of one thing. It's something that they call the white lobster. We're here in the Mosquito Coast. 
coast of Nicaragua doing a story about lobster diving, but we hear there's something much more valuable called the white lobster, and we're going to find out what that is. I heard there's a, a new industry called the white lobster. Um, La langosta blanca. <laughs> langosta blanca. What does it look like? Just a little thing like that. Have you ever found any white lobster? If I yeah. find that white, white lobster, I, I think I wouldn't work on it here, though. <laughs> Residents of the Mosquito Coast have always relied on the bounty of the sea. And these days, lobster is by far the region's largest industry. But not long ago, another much more valuable product began to appear in the same waters. And it too commonly makes its way to North America. You know it. Paquete <laughs> colombiano. Paquete colombiano. Along this coast is one of the world's busiest cocaine corridors. The route from the world's largest producer of cocaine, Colombia, to the world's greatest consumer, the US, passes right by the mosquito. The vast majority of this cocaine is moved by speedboats, and when they capsize or traffickers are feeling the heat from the Navy or police, the cargo is often dumped overboard. Days later, the waterproof packages wash up on beaches like this one. And later, those packages are found by local people. They take these packages home and the drug traffickers who know the, the currents well and know where these packages are going to end up come to these communities and buy back those packages from the local people. And they can buy it back for up to $5,000 a kilo, which is serious money here. So very often you see people walking back and forth on these beaches looking for these packages, which actually they call the white lobster here. White lobster has become like a shadow economy to the mosquito's traditional lobster industry. In the original business, men have to catch hundreds of pounds just to scratch out a living. But finding even just a few pounds of the white lobster is like winning the lottery. So he was saying that people, many people here dream about finding this white lobster. Si me da una oportunidad, si me encuentro, aleluya. <laughs> the Mosquito Coast is largely cut off from the rest of Nicaragua and the laws that govern it. Poverty and unemployment are widespread, so when cocaine began washing up on shore here, many locals received it as a blessing. Hay personas que conversan que decía que si te cae un kilo, dos kilo de coca, eh, te cayó como el maná del cielo, pues te cayó todo lo que necesitaba para solucionar tu problema. Alejandro Correa is the head of a local NGO that works with youth at risk and drug-related problems. He says that the arrival of cocaine introduced a whole new dynamic to life on the mosquito. La playa se ha convertido en una en otro tipo de, de, de barrio, en otro tipo de comunidad, hay su propia su propio Dynamic. propio movimiento. Es más que todo la playa ahora para esperar que la droga caiga. Mm -hmm. Is today a good day to find the white lobster? Oh yeah, you know, see the, the current. The current is there and the breeze. So there, it's very windy and there's a strong current. Oh, so yeah. it's a good so day to find a white fast. lobster. What? what if you find the white lobster? If we find it, we gotta get it, that's our luck. What it's, do you do with it once you pick it up? I do with it, sell I gotta it. sell, you it, sell it, it get my money and do what I have to do. Los mismos jóvenes y los niños pues ya, ya comienzan a ver como una actividad económica, ¿no? Bien lucrativa, bastante lucrativa. Alejandro described what he called a culture of acceptance on the mosquito, where the discovery and sale of drugs isn't seen as participating in an illegal trade, but as someone's good fortune. And who has gotten lucky? That's more or less an open secret here. Most of the houses here are built out of wood, so when you see large concrete houses, people here say that it's probably because the owner uh, got, quote, a blessing from God or, or somehow is involved in the narco-trafficking world. Let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go, let's go. Let's go, let's go. Let's go. Let's go. Okay, so maybe it's not exactly a secret that most people would like shared. But communities here definitely have a sort of laissez-faire attitude towards the drug trade, says Subcommissioner Alberto Garcia. Para la comunidad, este, no no es un delito para la comunidad. Hay un lema que dice: la droga es mala, pero el dinero es bueno. 
Garcia also told me about how recently locals rebelled when police seized 1,500 kilos of cocaine at the port and tried to take it to be burned. Many felt destroying the drugs was a waste and that the money could be used to benefit the community. So all these boats and uh, these cars were confiscated by the police and they were being used to transport cocaine. It's a bullet hole, he's saying, because there was a... So he's saying that one of these small speedboats here was taking, uh, was carrying 200 kilos of cocaine. So it had three 250 horsepower engines and uh, he's saying that it flies. I mean, it's much faster than any other boat owned by the Marine, by the, the Navy or the, or the police here. The police not only have to contend with big-time traffickers moving large amounts of product to the U.S., but also smaller players who supply a growing local market. Crack has become a big problem on the Mosquito. Costing only about 60 cents, a rock of crack is cheaper than beer, and local gangs now fight for control of the trade. For all the good fortune finding the white lobster promises, many locals have come to recognize that there is ultimately a price to be paid. But like the endless supply of the trade itself, there is no shortage of moral ambivalence. They say it's a blessing from God when you find it. I don't think so. That's the devil work. That's, that's the devil work. But you would still like to find well, it. Well, surely money, you know. Everybody loves money. The money is the, the, the Bible said it. The money is root of all evil. And we like we know it comes from the devil, but we poor people and you know we find a two kill that is money already that's looking at ten thousand dollars. And here you are you can get that here just to work in Nicaragua. <laughs>